generations to come. And welcome to another edition of the TDN Writer's Room. My name is Bill Finley. I'm a correspondent for the TDN, and I also do the Down the Stretch radio show on Saturdays with Mr. Dave Johnson. Tune us in. Nice to be with you guys again. I'm Randy Moss with uh, NBC Sports with uh, all my uh, paperwork here. It's all over the place. Getting ready for the uh, California Crown this weekend. We'll be on site at Santa Anita. I'll get to see Zoe in person. And I'm going to hug you very, very tightly. I truly am. I'm Zoe Cabin with First Racing and XBTV. And guys, look, I am finally home. It's, it's been 10 weeks and I'm here. I am just delighted to be home. All right, guys. Well, the big story last weekend, of course, was the races that went on at Parks, the two grade ones, the Cotillion and the Pennsylvania Derby. And... Cotillion is the one that we want to talk about. We'll get back to the Pennsylvania Derby because it included Torpedo and a legitimate contender for Horse of the Year. Um, she won. She got the job done. Uh, but I don't think it was nearly her best effort. Uh, she ran a 93 buyer. That's a big drop back from what she ran in the Travers and not even not quite as fast. She had run in some of these Philly races where she got 95, 99, 96. Um, do I take anything away from it or do I think less of her? No. Um, she did not have a particularly good trip. She was uh, caught along the inside for a while before Brian Hernandez could find some room. And I do have to think that Kenny McPeak looked at this race as a step to get to the Breeders' Cup distaff. And I would imagine he didn't have her as tight as she could be. So as she goes into the distaff, um, she loses nothing in my book. Wow. Um, well, I'll go. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you expected her to do, Bill. She was in a jackpot situation. I think she could only do as much as she could. Now, if I am Brian Hernandez and he's ridden her on point every single time, but you're 10 cents on the dollar. I mean, for the love of God, she breaks inside. He had every opportunity just to go on. You're 10 cents on the dollar. You're one to nine. Just go. The opening quarter was 23 and four. Don't let them box you in. You're riding against smart riders. You got Johnny V on the outside of you. You've got Pratt who rode a terrific race trying to just keep her in aboard Tarifa and keeping her in and not giving her the elbow or doing anything untoward, just race riding and riding a terrific race. That was a pure example of Johnny V, Flavian Pratt, just race riding Brian Hernandez and he took the bait. He went inside. He should have just gone on and played it safe. Just go. You're on the best horse. And I love Brian to bits. And I'm sure he's played this over, over and over again. She won because she's a very damn good filly. I'm not sure how much more. I mean, could she have won by 10 from that kind of trip? I don't think so. I, she lost absolutely nothing. She did not get the best rights. It's as simple as that. I love it when jockeys analyze other jockeys. I think that's, I think that's fantastic. <laughs> Uh, and I, I mean, really, the only reason she won is because those riders that you mentioned didn't have enough horse to keep Brian yes. Hernandez boxed in. That's the yeah. only reason he got out. And he even admitted that after yep. the race. And some of the other jockeys, Johnny Velasquez said, I look, I wanted to keep him in there, but I just didn't have the horse. I, I don't, having said that, I don't think anybody expected Torpedo Anna to come back and run another 111 buyer like she did when she was chasing fierceness in the Travers. I mean, that wasn't going to happen. Uh, and normally, I think when you hear trainers uh, after the fact, uh, and they say that, well, I didn't have this horse quite as tight as I should have, it, you normally just let that go in, in one ear and out the other. That's usually just trainer speak trainer excuses. But in this case, I believe it. I, you know, she was one to 10, as you pointed out, by far the best. I, I don't think McPeak felt that he had to have her totally cranked up to win. And one of the things that he said after the race that, that really, you know, uh, strikes that point, drives it home. He said, the next race is the one we really, really want to win. And that, of course, being the Breeders' Cup distaff. Kenny McPeak right now is 0 for 37 lifetime in the Breeders' Cup. Now, if you think that doesn't bother him, if you think that he's not tired of hearing that, I promise you he is. And here's the, here's the golden opportunity. I mean, he's had 
seven seconds and 10 thirds in the Breeders' Cup in the past. But Torpedo Anna is going to be a solid favorite in the Breeders' Cup distaff. And that's the race that I think McPeak desperately wants to win. Oh, for 37? Holy yeah, Bobby no. Frankel was 0 for 38 uh, going into the 2001 Breeders' Cup Sprint when he won with Squirtle Squirt. And wow. and right now, uh, McPeak is 0 for 37. Yeah. I got and, one other thing. Okay. Well, one more thing about the runner-up gun song. How on earth was she 44 to 1? Yeah. She's a good filly. She's a grade two winner. She just won the local prep over the course at Parks, a place where things usually stay there. So the fact that she was a winner over the track, she was 44 to 1. She's a good filly. Really good filly. Randy, I want to throw it back to you because you said something interesting. Torpedo and I, yeah, she'll be the favorite in the Breeders' Cup distaff. Uh, but what about Adair Manor? I mean, she's oh, yeah. going to take a lot of money as well. Yeah, it's not going to be a walkover. Right. That's for sure. I mean, Adair Manor, uh, who just won her last race very impressively, given the fact that she was completely taken out of her normal game, off the pace, wide around both turns. And there's even, uh, you, you know, Think back to what the Japanese did at Del Mar. There's even a Japanese horse that's being pointed for the distaff that I believe is undefeated. And she's, you know, when you saw what they did with Marsh Lorraine at a huge price in the distaff at Del Mar before, you're not going to be able to ignore the Japanese horse either. So I do think Torpedo Anna will be the favorite, but I mean, she's, she's going to have to be, uh, she's going to have to bring her A game. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing issue that's come up and Kenny McPeak is already touting her for horse of the year uh, in the uh, NTRA poll that came out, the top 10 poll. She is on top, which is very narrowly over fierceness. He has said that and then, you know, this is his opinion. And obviously it's not um, objective. If she wins the distaff, she's horse of the year. Now, I'm Torpedo Anna's biggest fan, but I, I don't think that's necessarily true. A lot would depend on what happens in the Breeders' Cup Classic and what happens if she wins the distaff and fierceness exactly. wins the Breeders' Cup Classic. I would have to think you'd have to give the horse of the year to fierceness. Oh, yeah. What? Oh, oh, totally. Totally. And, and and here's a softball for you, Bill. What if next wins the Breeders' Cup turf? Ooh, man, that's an exciting <laughs> thought, isn't it? Um I would not make him horse of the year because it would really kind of be like a one race wonder. I mean, you know, he can win all these three mile races that he wants. They, the competition is light. And uh, I mean, look, I've been asking, I've been asking these guys to run this horse in the Breeders' Cup for well over a year now, and I finally might get my wish. So, uh, but no, I would not make him horse. Why, why, hey, fierceness gets beat in the classic and the classic is an oddball result. Torpedo Anna loses the distaff. Next wins yeah. the Breeders' Cup turf. Maybe, yeah. maybe. We're That's a lot of this, though, Randy. Someone will vote <laughs> for him. You know that'll happen. All right. So let's get to the Pennsylvania Derby now, the uh, feature race on the card. You know, I, I would admit something. I didn't give Cesar Gray any chance whatsoever. I thought that she was just, since the Preakness, she just wasn't herself. Uh, her two prep races coming into it. Him, were, him, him, him. That's right, of course, him. His two prep races coming into it were just not good. Seventh in the Belmont, fourth in the Jim Dandy. Uh, he just looks like a horse that was over the top. Wayne was saying before the race, he's doing great. He's going to run the race of his life. Wayne has said that about every single horse he's ever run in his entire career. So, you know, you take that with a grain of salt, but this time he was absolutely right. And I think one of the differences this time, she really, why do I keep calling her a she? That's so stupid. He <laughs> definitely likes to be on the lead. And given the trip that he got in front with the young apprentice, Jamie Torres, that made him doubly tough. And um, did he beat the best field that's been assembled this year? No, not even anywhere close. And it pales in comparison to the Travers or some races like that. But he got the job done. And whenever 89-year-old Wayne Lucas wins a race, puts a smile on your face, Zoe. It, it really does. And it's just shown that this horse needs a little bit of space between his races. And we know that, you know, Wayne comes up with all these other excuses. Perhaps he was colicking in the post parade at one point, a couple of races back, all, all kinds of stuff. But he looked great going into that race. He's a full big bodied horse. And, and he looked it. He looked as good as I've ever seen him look going in. And he got the trip he wanted. And kudos to Wayne, who over the years has, kind of jump from 
jockey to jockey on a horse. If a horse didn't run a good race, he switched the jockey and such, so forth. He stuck with Jaime Torres throughout this horse's career. I don't know if that's got something to do with the 2,500 owners he has to answer to or what the deal is, but he stuck with Jaime Torres and it's paid off. It, it really has. I thought Stronghold ran a hell of a race. Dragoon Guard got took out of his game. He had a little bit of a stutter step. I'm not sure if Laurent could have made the lead on him if he'd wanted. So he actually ate some dirt for the very first time. And I thought he ran a commendable race to be third. So let me interject something for you. I asked Wayne Lucas before the race the very question that you proposed about Torres. And he's kind of said this and that. And then this last sentence was the most telling. You know what? I really like the guy. Yeah. That was his reason. I mean, that's a good reason, a likable guy. And he's done a great job. So, but you're right. It was uh, the type of loyalty you don't see too often. He said seven jockey agents called him and asked him to put their, uh, their jockey on over, uh, over young Mr. Torres. And he stuck by him. I'm glad I can't bet at the quarter pole. I'd be busted right now. Uh, the way Stronghold <laughs> ran up to seize the gray and it looked like yeah. he had him. He might have even stuck his nose in front. But we've seen that before from Seize the Gray. When he's in peak form, he can be a pretty determined customer. The Pat Day Mile looked like he was absolutely beaten. Uh, he looked like he had no chance at the quarter pole, and he fought on gamely to win. And the Preakness, I don't think anybody thought he was going to win coming to the quarter pole. Uh, drifted out a little, and yet he held on to win. Uh, I, the only way I could have bet him in this spot is if I thought that he was going to control the pace. And, and I don't know if you could have really thought that for sure going in, because like like you pointed out, Bill, I mean, there were reasons to believe that he was over the top. OK, we know Wayne, when he has a good horse, is not afraid to campaign the horse aggressively. OK, remember, he ran into Jeff Ruby two weeks later. Wayne brought him back to run in the bluegrass because he wanted to get enough Kentucky Derby points. That didn't work. He couldn't make the Derby, so he ran in the Pat Day Mile. And yes, he won the Preakness. He didn't run in the Derby Preakness Belmont, but he still ran three times in five weeks because he came back to run in the Belmont Stakes, even though it was a mile and a quarter. He was dueling for the lead, if you remember, with Dornuck. And he backed up and finished uh, you know, a pretty d d disappointing. He was beaten a dozen links. It, nowadays, you don't want to run three times in five weeks if you can help it. They gave him seven weeks off and brought him back in the gym dandy, ran poorly, got beat another 12 lengths. So to think that the eight weeks was going to be all the difference in the world after two races like that, you know, I thought that three races in five weeks had had an effect. And that's why I, I couldn't like him. But, hey, coach did it again. Sure did. Well, that was some of the action on the racetrack, but the action again. And I'm so glad Zoe's back. You, should, Zoe, me and Ra Randy and I tried so hard last week to <laughs> sound like we knew what we were talking about when it comes to the Keeneland sale. I don't know if we put one over on anybody or not, but uh, you guys uh, already know the story and the TDN headline Keeneland blockbuster pretty much sums it all up. They had the record gross, record average, and tied for the record median. Gross of $411 million, average sale price 150000 Zoe, what is it about this sale or the yearling market in particular where it just doesn't have a ceiling? It doesn't seem to, right? I mean, it was absolutely incredible the amount of people that were there and the amount of people that stayed there i think was the key point because usually you see a big turnover you have book one and book two and then the friday the first friday of the sales week is a dark day where they switch over to book three so usually all the euros and you know all the people with the money in the private planes skedaddle and they're gone and the book three people come in on that friday well a lot of people got shut out in the first two books. So they stayed and it had a trickle down effect. So people that usually would stay for book two stayed for book three. And then the book three people stayed for book four. You still couldn't buy a horse in book five. I mean, it was absolutely insane. I'm gonna like read off some extra stats. 48 consigners sold a horse for 500,000 or more. That's 48 separate consigners. There were 96 different buyers who spent a million or more during the sale. 
buyers representing 31 countries were there. I mean, just think about it. 31 different countries shopped at Keeneland during those two weeks. TaylorMade was the year, uh, the leading consigner for the 25th time since 1988. That's just incredible. Selling 333 yearlings for $53 million and change. Others involved obviously were Gainsway, Paramount, Hillendale and Lane's End. The leading side by gross was Gunrunner. No surprise there. 62 yearlings sold for 32 million and change. Seven of them went for a million plus. Charlatan was the leading first crop sire. I've been really, really impressed by his progeny with a whopping 79 yearlings going through for $20 million and change. So it really was a terrific sale. And I think someone said to me the other day, they're like, boy, you know, just when you think the economy is bust, where is all this money coming from? Mm. It's just like people go under their mattress when the sales come around and just find all this money all of a sudden. It's a great for sellers, great for buyers, and kudos to Keeneland for sticking to the format that seemingly works. Obviously, there's there's some things that will need tweaking. Uh, there were actually a few RNAs. I think there were 153 RNAs that were sold post sale. So that 411 million, I think, went to 427 million with all of those post-sale grads. So it, it was terrific. I can't, I can't begin to tell you what a good sale it was. Tough to buy. Everything you just said, Bill and I were getting ready to say. I'm, I'm glad That's you right. went there. I'm glad you went first. <laughs> <laughs> if you believe that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Randy, I guess you're going to just let Zoe carry the baton for us across the wire. She can she can take it from wire to wire. Wire to wire. All, All right. right. Yay, Zoe's back. Good job, Zoe. I'm going to continue with the Keeneland talk. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Keeneland's September yearling sale concluded its record-breaking run on Saturday with total sales of $411,749,500. Don't forget that making it the highest grossing thoroughbred auction in the world. The average of $150,548 is a September sales record, while the median of $70,000 equals the record for a September sale. Up next, more sales to come, guys. Get those entries in for the November sale. Entries for the print catalog close on October the 1st. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. Keeneland, a horse will always be measured in hands. Hands that see, that sense, that speak. Hands that hold our sport to a higher standard, not for our sake, but for theirs, for the love of the horse, for generations to come. The fastest horse of the week is brought to you this week by Constitution, one of those fast sires at Windstar Farm. Constitution, unfortunately, has no idea how he did at Keeneland September, but we can be proud for him because three of his yearlings sold for seven figure prices, including a $1.2 million colt. Another 37 yearlings sold for six figures and Constitution finished the sale as the seventh leading sire by yearling sales average. Some of the big name owners who bought Constitution's Spinthrift Farm and Micropoli, who went on with four each. Agent Steve Young and Lyle Stable of Barbaro fame bought three, Mayberry Farm, Belladonna Racing, and Alex Bregman bought two Constitutions each. It was a big sale for Constitution. In case you're curious, Constitution would have been the fastest horse of the week way back in the first week of February 2015 when he ran a 111 buyer speed figure in taking Gulfstream Park's Don Handicap. The fastest horse of this week, we'll be talking about more in depth a little later in this podcast. It would be next. We scored a repeat win Saturday in the Greenwood Stakes. Uh, at Parks Racing on the Pennsylvania Derby undercard next, recorded a buyer speed figure of 102. 
Our guest of the week this week, one of our favorites, Peter Rotondo of First Racing, who's been a very familiar face behind the scenes in racing for a long time, 20 years with the Breeders' Cup, a few years as a consultant with First, and now as of September 1, the Senior Vice President of Racing and Wagering at First Racing. Congratulations on that, Pete. Um, So we're all familiar with what Belinda Stronach has done with the Pegasus World Cup at Gulfstream Park. Um, What was the impetus now behind the California crown? Well, I think it goes back to before, you know, before COVID, right? The idea was Pegasus really hit its hit its stride, right? In late 2019. And then, you know, there was COVID for a minute, right? And then it kept going. They had a group down there called uh, Grutman. Dave Grutman and his crew at, at, uh, in Miami that she partnered up with to create the Pegasus. Hospitality, lifestyle, they brought all the DJs in, the whole nine yards. In LA, there's a guy named John Terzian. It's with, he's with Hwood Group. Uh, they All these hot clubs down, I'm too old at this point to say the words hot clubs, but <laughs> right, Delilah and Bootsy Bellows, um, Evan Funky, like really, uh, Chef Evan Funky, but then he plays his Funky, like super cool, Great restaurants, clubs, whole nine yards. So long story short, they knew each other a long time. They said, we need to do something. She, Belinda always wanted to bring the Pegasus West, and this is it, right? So this is the California crown. I think it was always in the back of her mind, of course, you know, California deserves a huge marquee event. There's some big events, as we know, but there's not this one like, ah, oh, that's the one. And I, listen, this is year one. I'm going to kick it off. I'm coming in strong. Um, but yeah, I think that sort of, it was always in the back of our mind, but it kicked in, uh, kicked in this year. Well, Pete, you've always got your finger on the pulse. I apologize for the noise behind me. I'm at yet another horse sale right now with planes actually flying overhead, but you've got your finger on the pulse of everything. What can we expect? We know you're in charge of the wagering. We'll get to that in just a little bit, but you know, you're kind of cool, savvy guy. What kind of entertainment can we expect? What are so, you looking forward to, Pete? What am I looking forward to? It's really simple. I'm looking forward to Shibuzi. Yeah. I mean, so Shibuzi has had, I pulled this stat yesterday. He has the number one song for 10 weeks in a row. Actually, 10 weeks total. Took off a week. It was the first time since 1958 where someone has had the same song for 10 weeks on the Hot 100 list. Again. I did my homework on this one. I told Jerry Bailey that one. So watch when he brings that up on the show this weekend. Um, but bottom line is Shibuzi, you know, he's got that one song that everybody loves, um, you know, Tipsy, a bar song. I'm looking forward to seeing him. There's some great DJs. The difference between Pegasus in the past and this event is that these performances, many of them, there'll be a couple afterwards, are going to happen during the races. So while we're live on NBC, on CNBC, Peacock, uh, Shibuzi will be on stage performing, right? <laughs> You'll be able to watch him from the set, basically, Randy. He'll be right there. So the idea is like, this is going to feel like really energy, the energy be through the roof. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, Frank Walker, Griffin, uh, Lil Yachty, who's a rapper. A lot of, again, if you hear some of the songs, Randy, you might know them, but, um, <laughs> the, you know, and then they have the, the food, right? Chef Evan Funky. He's about to do a Netflix show on him. He's the real deal. I mean, he's going to make all the, all types of food. In fact, he's making this pizza um, as part of as part of the activation. And then in the backyard, well, sort of in the back of the paddock, they have something called Exacta Eats. So all these different venues are going to pop up, like hot, you know, fun LA restaurants, and even one from New York, Prince Street Pizza, is coming in. So this is literally something for everybody, I think. So one of the great things about Pete, if you can't tell already, is that not only does he know everything about racing and he's good at his job and he's a hell of a horse player, he loves a good party. That's something that we all uh, that we all can appreciate and enjoy. In this case, we haven't even talked about the horses yet. I mean, you've added $1.8 million to the purses of the John Henry, of the Eddie D, and what used to be the Awesome Again. Now it's the California mm-hmm. Crown. But this is this is not – it's racing, but it's a lot more than racing. That's the object, Right. Yeah, exactly. I and mean, that's the whole point. That's what the Pegasus is. And if you ask, I ask a lot, I have people that are like the most cranky, hardened people, guys I know and gals. And they're like, you know, the Pegasus is the most fun event 
And now the racing has gotten up to that point. You know, it, it's that it's got a spot on the calendar in late January, not only in racing, but in, in Miami lifestyle. So this is this is basically that run at that. And it's about fusing both together, lifestyle, the entertainment and the races. And, you know, again, Belinda, Aiden, Butler, my boss, they made the decision to fund the purses. It's that's coming out of their pocket um, to these these the whole day. So, you know, that's a, that's quite an investment. And actually, the purse account save 600,000 because they're actually funding all the purses. So it's, it's a major investment. And then you have the Hollywood nightlife, John Terzi and the H group helping out on the lifestyle side to throw this event. And it's year one. I mean, I was, I was talking about it, like, like the Kentucky Derby and the pre been around 150 years. The Pegasus has only been around eight. This is year one. Well, isn't it a natural out there? I mean, horse racing has a history, a long history of celebrities and movie stars and all that, but it's all in California. It's at Del Mar. It was at Hollywood Park or Santa Anita, right? I mean, this this could be like a hand in glove kind of thing. Exactly. And, and I, you know, listen, we went through some rough times, obviously, in the, you know, a couple of years back. Now it's time to go on offense and it's time to rebuild. And that's what we're doing. And, you know, and we're going all in. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. A lot of energy and, and work has gone into this event. Yeah, and it's an experience, like you mentioned. I was at the first um, Pegasus event, and that has blossomed into some really good racing, especially this year. That was an awful lot of fun. So this is only going to get bigger and better. What can we expect from the wagering side? How are we going to make some money, Pete? Because I'm all about making money. Yeah, well, so we lost... So Santa Anita has tweaked the autumn wagering menu to begin with, right? So the pick six is now a $2 pick six, like the old days, right? You know, they had done the jackpot, they went to one, they went, now they're going to $2. The late pick three is a $3 bet, 15% takeout. 15%, $3 minimum. Um, and that'll be all, all the time at Santa Anita, uh, you know, for this meet. But obviously on California Crown Day, you have three great races in a row, um, you know, three stakes. As far as special wagers on this day, we're going to do an all stakes pick five, $1 uh, minimum, 15% takeout, and they unzip me into the, uh, you know, the Eddie D, the California Crown, John Henry, and the City of Hope. And then there'll be some two day bets, all 15% take at various minimums, a pick six into Sunday Zenyatta and Santa Anita Sprint Championship. There's going to be a pick four. Uh, there's going to be special daily doubles linking the Zenyatta and the California Crown. Bottom line is we want people to pay attention to these races. And if if you get involved, you know, you know how it is. If you look at one of the races, you look at two, and you're like, wait a second, this bet's offered. I got to jump in. And especially 15% takeout, it's 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 player friendly, right? So that's so that's kind of it. And then, of course, we have a big handicapping tournament, $6,000 buy-in. Um, and then also the Coast to Coast pick five with Gulfstream returns. Again, five, um, 15% take. So there are wagering menu is out of control. Look, at the end of the day, you look at your sports betting app when you go into bet sports, there's prop bets, there's all types of wagers. We got to we got to offer. We got to make the menu a little bigger. So that's what we're doing. So Pete's obvious passion for the wagering menu uh comes naturally, right? His uh his father also Peter is is one of the great characters in horse racing. Uh heck of a handicapper and a better himself. Uh, you might have seen him in Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, along with Pete there, and Horse Players, the series. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very well known. Um, but it goes back a lot further than just your dad. I mean, talk talk about your first introduction to the races and how you got involved so deeply. Yeah, so I, I mean, I went to the races for the first time. I was four months old at Saratoga with my, and with my grandmother, my my mom, my father. Uh, so, I mean, way back when my dad told me how to read the racing form when I was six, literally, you know, I was like at, at six years old, he used to take me on the weekends to OTB. I grew up at New York city OTB. I mean, like the childhood one can only dream of, um, and, <laughs> but it was odd. I loved every second of it. Right. Yeah. He wouldn't let me bet though. Honestly, it was crazy. Now looking back, he would never let me bet until I was 18. He would make, I, yeah. Sure. No, I I could not. I could make the bets for him though. Like, and it, well, if I had money, I was not allowed to bet my own money. So, but anyway, so I got into that, and then of course I went to the race. I went to Seton Hall for two years, but transferred to Racetrack Industry Program. So I went there for a year and a half. 
I got a four year degree at it. I maneuvered a little bit with the transferring of the credits and then actually worked with the daily racing form. And then the NTRA, when it had just started, literally 98, whatever, 97, and then uh, wound up on the Breeders' Cup side. But yeah, I've been a handicapper my whole life, um, you know, since birth, essentially. Have, have you ever had the urge to actually dabble into horse ownership? Well, yeah, my dad used to own horses in the 80s, um, you know, back way back when, right? <laughs> Not, I guess that is the 80s for way back when now, right? Uh, and we, I, we got involved. I got involved here and there. Not too much. I mean, I've always, yeah, I would love to. I mean, my wife ran the marketing for my racehorse, so I was always felt like I was part of so many horses because obviously they have a lot of horses and we felt like we were rooting for all of them all the time. In fact, you know, this year's Preakness was one of the major thrills uh, having been there on site, you know, and Shona was there and the horse won, sees the gray. It was like, is this for real? That was wild. But um, yeah, there's nothing like owning a horse. I mean, you know, but owning and betting the horses, I, you know, that's, that's what it's all about. I mean, it's just, it's such an experience. So your days at the NTRA and the Reader's Cup, I know that's how I got to know you. You were heavily involved with the broadcast side of things. So now SVP of racing and wagering at first, uh, Tell us about that job and exactly what that entails. Well, again, so I'm Aiden Butler's my boss, one of the, one of the great guys in this business. Um, just great to work for, has your back at, at every second. Uh, you know, I just, it's, it's like having someone you could talk to, like a normal person, you know, like in this racing, in this uh, industry world we live in, and this, with that, you know, that uh, speak, so to speak. We just talk like normal people, right? Like we get stuff done. Like it's like, uh, you know, I can't stand those buzzwords that people use, whatever. Well, we don't use any of that. So my job right now, global. So I do a lot of these global partnerships now. So if you haven't noticed, we've been doing some automatic qualifiers. Like with Gulfstream had a, you know, had a win in your in, although we're not allowed to use that because the Breeders' Cup has that trademark because they're smart. Um, actually, they used to do that, right? But anyway, the, um, the, it's an automatic qualifier for Royal Ascot. In the last two years, um, the two-year-olds, one of them won, Crimson Aggregate last year, had won at, at Goldstream, won, and then Gavadon this year just missed at Ascot. So now we started other races. So we've worked with Goodwood. We've worked with Newmarket, Sandown, uh, Doncaster, even, you know, on some, some, of the, um, some of the races. And we're just going to continue to grow that. And, you know, we, part of the first business is the international wagering. We control, we, we basically work with a lot of the U.S. racetracks and then sell the rights to the betting overseas. So it's like, it's a partnership with all the racetracks and then also overseas. So basically it's good for everyone to us to have this, uh, these partnerships. So that's one of them. And then trying to come up with new wagers, new partners out there. I don't know if you hear that, but it's, they're working on the track. I can tell you that. Um, is, is, is part of the, uh, as part of the game, some of the content that, you know, we're working on, obviously it's still working on with the NBC you know, like next year, of course, the first racing tour will be back and we will have shows uh, all spring. So there's a lot going on. Stay away from Pimlico. <laughs> <laughs> until Preakness, until Preakness, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, yeah, Pim Pimlico. Yeah, so Preakness 150 next year at Pimlico. Frank. Um, and then Pimlico will you know, no longer be with us. It will redo it. And then it moves to Laurel for a couple of years. But um, yeah, I mean, listen, you got to change. You got to adapt. You got to invest. I mean, this is what it's all about. So and that's what we're doing here this weekend. And we can hear some of the change going on in the background. Honestly, I thought it was a small child screaming. But, <laughs> but just not, there. But there, it there. would be. If, if I was home, it would be for sure. <laughs> I guess an airplane. <laughs> We've got it all. That, that, that was a plane. I got one more question. And sure. The most important question of all. What shoes are you wearing, Pete? Um, well, I did bring six pairs of shoes with me, for some, I, which is outrageous. I'm here, th I'm here six days. But I just couldn't make any decisions this morning. So what I just threw them. Saturday? Saturday, I got some nice ones. I got some, uh, some gold Adidas. I think they're like gold, you know. For your California crown, you know, got to shake it up a little bit. I want Shibuzi to notice me, and that's the key. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we got to get Randy on the stage, honestly. I can oh, just no. keep Randy oh, no. down. Oh, no. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do a duet with, with Shibuzi. How about that? There you go. You need that. No, um, the race, 
but the races themselves have come up great. I mean, yeah. the, the John Henry, you know, so that we did this thing, the first grand three, we called it, right? So it's linking the Preakness, uh, California Crown and the Pegasus, the dirt races, but then also the turf races and Balnikoff won the dinner, dinner party stakes on Preakness Day. He's now eligible for $2.5 million bonus if he can win the John Henry and then win Pegasus turf. That's hard to do, whatever, but he's got a shot. He's in it. He's running. Um, so that's that's exciting. Obviously, um, big invasion. So I'll give you a little inside info. So this summer, Jody Vela Gregory, who I work with, and Megan Wernemann, of course, you know, works with me now, used to work for the Breeders' Cup. We went on a backside tour at Saratoga, promoting the California Crown to the, to the trainers, whatever. Long story short, I went into Miguel Clement, and we told him all about the California Crown. And he goes... I'm coming with Big Invasion. I'll be there. And this is August. This is like August 5th. I'm like, okay. He's like, he'll love it there. He loves Santa Anita. He likes the turf, you know, firm, whatever. He can't run on the wet grass. Blah, blah, blah. He's like, I'm there. I'm like, all right, boom. And he's coming on the plane and he'll be here on Saturday. So that was cool. And then also um, Grand Motion's bringing Trickery. I think that's how you say it, right? Trickery? Yeah. Tricari? Yeah. Trickery. Yeah. So, uh, and he's got a big shot. I mean, that horse has turned into a nice horse. So I'm looking forward to it. And then, of course, the big race, you know, National Treasure, who won, the, you know, who won the Preakness, won the Pegasus. And it's interesting, though, if you really look at the race, there's a couple of them that really love Santa Anita, right? And then a couple, they've run big numbers, but they haven't gotten the job done. So I think it's kind of an evenly matched field. Yeah, we'll see what happens. What do you guys think? Have you looked at it yet? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh it's going to be a it's a fantastic day of racing it's a fantastic day uh around the track other than racing uh and uh, everybody's going to have a fantastic time we we have a video here i think it comes from horse player uh, of you and your father cheering horses or a horse that oh, you man. might have had a small investment on as the horses come down the stretch when when people ask me about my job I always say, and Zoe probably says the same thing, I hope I never have to get a real job. Yeah. That's got to be kind of the way you feel too, right? Right. No, I, I mean, because I love it, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, anything you love that you're able to do that you love is, is amazing. I mean, I, you know, anything, I, this is why it's such a, working with these guys at first, the team here, I mean, Zoe's part of the team, right? It's like they're so passionate about trying to make things better. <laughs> and and it's it's not you know, I'm not blowing smoke up anyone. You know what I mean? This is real. It's a real passion for it. And, you know, a lot of, I feel like we're on the, again, I feel like we kind of went into defense. Before I was, my time, there was defensive mode, right? You were just playing defense, trying to not keep away all the, the haters or whatever. And now it's time to go on offense and we're ready to go. All right. Peter Rotondo of First Racing will be one of the busiest guys at Santa Anita from now until Saturday. Look forward to seeing you out there. We'll be out there for NBC live and in, live and in person uh, to do it on site. We're looking forward to that. Thanks so much for Thank taking you. the time out of your schedule. We really appreciate it. And and congratulations on the uh, on the new official title and good luck Saturday. Thanks, Randy. Thanks, Zoe. Thanks. The TD and Riders Room also brought to you by the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association. Another profitable weekend for Pennsylvania breads. On Friday, Roses for Debra won the Presque Isle Downs Masters, a grade two stake. She's now a perfect five for five on the tapita surface, all at Presque Isle. And Roses for Debra's career earnings are now up to $817,000. And 24 hours later, Uncle Heavy made a big move wide around the second turn of the Pennsylvania Derby, but he had to settle for a good fourth behind Seize the Gray Stronghold and Dragoon Guard. And also the PA Bread Stallion Series kicked off on the Pennsylvania Derby undercard with two $100,000 stakes races for two-year-olds, won by the Boys Warrior and Honorable Win. That series has six remaining $100,000 Stakes. It is a good time to own a two-year-old in Pennsylvania. If you want more information on that schedule or about anything regarding the PA a breeding industry, you can go to pabread.com or you can call this number 610-444-1050. PA Bread, I think we've built a brand at this point. It's a constant labor of love. It's excitement. 
at every step. On average, for the past decade, Pennsylvania paid over $28 million a year in breeders' awards, restricted races, and owner bonuses. Plus, PA bred shine on the world's biggest stage. Just three states have bred more Breeders' Cup winners. Learn more at pabred.com. With some of the fullest fields in the country and quality racing year-round, there's never been a better time to reap the rewards of breeding and racing in Kentucky. Purse money in Kentucky is at an all-time high, as is average purse per race, outpacing California, Florida, and New York. Kentucky Breads. Breed them. Raise them. Race them. We all win. The TD and Riders Room brought to you by Kentucky Breads, who predictably cleaned up on that ridiculously lucrative Kentucky Downs meet. Kentucky Downs had... <laughs> 15 seven-figure stakes racers, 13 of which were won by Kentucky Breads. The $2 million grade one Franklin Simpson stakes went to Howard Wallowitz, the horse named for the character in the Big Bang Theory, and the $2 million grade two Kentucky Turf Cup that was won by Grand Sonata. During that seven-day meet, Kentucky Breads won more than $12 million in first place money. That's not even counting the money that they earned in other placings. Kentucky Breads, breed them, raise them, race them, we all win. Well, Friday marks the start of the Santa Anita Fool Me, my favorite place on earth, guys. So we are back with another edition of First Things First. All right, we're in the palatial office space of general manager of Santa Anita Park, Mr. Nate Newby. We've got Doodle in the background having his sausage and his breakfast. Thank he's cool. glad He's glad to be back. Are you? Absolutely. Opening weekend of the autumn meet's always fun. To kick off the first two weekends, there's 15 stakes races, so the action starts quick and it's just a five-week meet, so it should be a lot of fun. It seems like we've put a lot of effort into the California crown. What, what is the essence of this? I know we're following on the heels of a very successful meet like at Goldstream with all the stakes action that they had there on the at Pegasus Day. Yeah, so we we're really just trying to create a, another big day. And so Pegasus started and, and was not what it is today on the first year. So this year will be our first year. We'll try and build it into a big event, but we're giving away over $3 million. And, and let's hope in, in a couple of years, we'll have a $40 million handle day similar to Pegasus. What kind of entertainment can we expect? Are you a Shibuzi fan? I, uh, I am. I am a big Shibuzi fan. You pretty much can't go anywhere without hearing <laughs> it's, it's the number one song in the country right now. So uh, it should be a lot of fun. And so great racing, entertainment, some amazing food. Uh, you can't go wrong. What about the wagering options we're offering? Are there some new ones on tap? Yeah, so we have some new wagers, both for the autumn meet, very player friendly, a $5 late double at 15% and a $3 uh, late pick three at 15%. Those will go every day. So it gives horse players a chance to, you know, kind of towards the end of the day when we're the only thing going, a very player friendly uh, shot to make a score. But then we have a bunch of special wagers on California Crown Day, an, an all stakes $1 pick five at 15%. So basically you got, uh, and some two day bets that connect to Sunday, because of course we have two graded stakes on Sunday. So um, basically throughout the day, you've got options, uh, very player friendly chances to make a good score. A lot to look forward to. Do we have some Hong Kong wagering action going on? Yeah, so we're really excited about that. The first time um, I think that I've been here, since I've been here where we're, uh, Hong Kong is gonna take our last four races. So um, all graded stakes, and those will be simulcast in Hong Kong. Uh, gonna be obviously good for handle, but also really just to get our signal international to a great market. Awesome, thanks Nate, looking forward to it. And Doodle thanks you for his sausage. Thanks Zoe, and Doodle. <laughs> Many thanks to GM Nate Newby. And yes, Doodle does get special sausage chopped up for him every time he goes to Santa Anita. One of the perks of being a first racing employee. You, Randy, if you bring your dog, you too can get free sausage on Santa <laughs> Anita. Wish he, did you hear that? But seriously, guys, it's going to be a terrific weekend of racing. Friday is opening day. Saturday is California Crown. And then don't forget, on Sunday, we have a couple of graded stakes as well, highlighted by the grade one Senyata stakes. It's all going on at Santa Anita, and it feels so good to be back home at the Great Race Place. 
Well, everything was not exactly perfect at parks on Saturday, despite some interesting races and very uh, entertaining runnings of the Cotillion and the Pennsylvania Derby. We had another horse breakdown on their turf course, had to be euthanized. Uh, it was in, in the Alphabet Soup Stakes, a uh, horse by the name of uh, Freedom Eagle. And the reason why, I mean, it happens and, and lot, many times, you know, maybe you just move on and go on with it. But the reason why this is a story today, and it's probably something that Heiser and Parks and a lot of people in the industry need to keep talking about is, it was well known that that turf course was a disaster. A matter of fact, that they, after the horse causes trouble, broke down on August 24th in the Parks Dash. There's a video that emerges showing these huge holes in the turf course. And then they they came back and ran on it again. And once again, I mean, uh, Tim Woolley, who won the race, sent out a video. And Randy, if if this was your backyard, the neighbors would have to throw, throw you out of the, the neighborhood. Um, it literally looked like there was nothing but dirt and weeds uh, on the course. They made a huge mistake going back to this course and not and running on it again. Um, I doubt very much they'll try to run any more turf races this year. But there's two options here. I think either fix it, which uh, the Horsemen's Bob Bob Hutt president says they're not going to do because they only care about the casino and they don't want to spend money on the racetrack. Or just stop running grass racing. You, you can't put horses and risk their safety and the safety of the jockeys on on what looks like a minefield. Yeah, it was. Uh, you're not going to you're not going to toot your own horn, as they say. But uh, I would encourage everyone to read Bill's uh, story on this particular topic. Uh, I think it's in yesterday's, which would be what Monday's TDN. Um, very very well sourced and covered. Um, look, it's it's not cheap to uh, to maintain in a quality manner a turf course, but they've got a casino. And so they've got, you would think they would have the revenue uh, to be able to have a lush, beautiful turf course. And I think that's one of the frustrations that you see among parks horsemen. And when you hear about surface issues in horse racing, typically it's dirt because dirt racing obviously is much less safe by the numbers than grass racing. But we've seen our share of, you know, of some grass racing, uh, some turf course issues as well lately. Uh, look what happened to Churchill Downs with their turf course. They're not running on it at all this fall. Uh, they've had so much problem with uh, so many problems with the installation of the new turf course. Uh, fairgrounds a few years ago, salt water got into their irrigation tanks and it burned up three quarters of the turf course at the fairgrounds. And they had to run on the outside rail for much of their meeting a few years ago, uh, way back 20 something years ago when Del Mar put in its brand new turf course. There was a, there were, I think, five breakdowns in two weeks and Del Mar had to stop racing on it temporarily while they tried to get all that stuff ironed out. So it's not just dirt racing that can be challenging as far as the surface is concerned. It can be grass racing as well. And, and you know, three cheers for Heiza. Okay, they, they were getting involved with, with parks. They, they don't have the, uh, uh, the, the authority to shut, I don't think, to shut turf racing down at any particular racetrack. They may advise. They may... You know, they may go out as they did and, and send their maintenance people out there and their, you know, their uh, their their track supers, basically, that they employ to look at and make recommendations and stuff, which they did. Um, but, yeah, something's something's got to be done. It honestly, it's never been great. I can remember writing on it 20 something years ago, aging myself. Sorry, guys. I know you thought I was so young, but <laughs> it, it wasn't great 20 something years ago. And in fairness, and, you know, I, I love Tim Woolley to bits, but if I'm a trainer or I'm an owner and entering a horse on that turf course, I'm walking it before, not after. So, I mean, he posted the video after his horse had won and that, that was great, but I want to walk it before and make sure it's safe for my horse. Randy, I want to get back to something you said. And, and um, you know, Heiser was very proactive in this. And yes, they can't tell them to stop racing on the turf, but they have this weapon, which is they can pull anybody's right to simulcast. And, um, you know, would that have been a pretty draconian thing to do? Yeah. But, but I would now, if I were Lisa Lazarus, I would be holding that over their heads. 
if you don't fix this thing or stop using it. I'm fine with them. Stop using it. They run one or two races a week on it. You know, with all that slot money, they got big fields and in, in good racing. Unlike like a Saratoga or something like that, that like really depends on turf racing. They don't depend on it at all. But if they either, they either have to spend the money to fix it or um, just abandon it. And uh, if they don't, you're, you lose your, your license to simulcast. So, they do have that power. Yeah. As you pointed out in your story, uh, Heisa sent some of its advisors to, turf, or to, uh, to parks to help out. Uh, they thought that it was exceedingly dry and that it needed to be uh, irrigated more frequently. Uh, they thought it needed to be aerated to stimulate some more growth. And then they sent their people back again, I believe you wrote. And they said that the turf course was showing some improvement. If it showed improvement, can you imagine what it looked like before? <laughs> All right. So let's move on to one of my favorite horses. I'm catching up with Randy. I got um, Bookham Dano and also next. But uh, Randy still got, got me beat with his four or five favorite horses. Uh, I, I talked to Doug Cowens, the trainer, and I started off the conversation. I said, Doug, what was the matter with your horse on Saturday? He said, well, what are you talking about? I said, I said, he only won by 10 lengths. What is going on here? And I think over the phone, uh, he got a little chuckle out of that. This horse is so cool. He's so neat. Um, you know, he just does everything that you can ask of in these marathon races. He's won, uh, where did I write my notes down somewhere? Um, he's won seven straight, nine of 10 overall since they put him into this category. Uh, but now, uh, last year, there was the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance race part of the Breeders' Cup card that was, uh, Zoe, how far is that? Was that? Mile and five-eighths. Mile and five-eighths. Um, it's not being run this year. So if they and will, if they want to stick to marathon dirt races, they have to wait all the way till next year. It's not even October 1st, and that's a long time to wait. So they are seriously considering the Breeders' Cup this time, and I'm so glad to hear that. I guess if they go, and I'm speaking to Doug Counts, I think they will, as long as the horse trains okay. Should he, Randy, run in the turf hmm. at a mile and a half because that's his best distance? Or should he run in the classic on the dirt at a mile and a quarter because that's his best surface? Or C, none of the above. Or none of the above. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I get the feeling from the quotes, and I haven't talked to uh, to Cowens about this. I've talked to him, but not about, you know, not recently. Um, I think the owner really is is more keen on going to the Breeders' Cup than 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 Cowan's is. And I'm not saying it's a bad idea. Uh, I don't think the classic would be the spot. I don't think a mile and a quarter is quite long enough for the horse. And I also think that with all the pace that's going to be in the classic, he's going to be taken completely out of his game. I think he like, I think we've seen from his past performances, he likes to be up close to the lead. As Cowan says, get into his rhythm get into that rhythmic stride and and this really let his stamina kick in. Conversely, if they go to the Breeders' Cup turf, it looks on paper like he's a better dirt horse than he is a grass horse. And you got to run against the Europeans uh, who there might even be a pacemaker in there. You never know. Um, so that also would seem to be a bit of a disadvantage to next. From a sporting standpoint, would it be cool to see him run? Yeah, it would be cool to see him run. If he were my horse, would I run him? No, I wouldn't. I've said that before. Uh, he's on a roll right now. He thinks he's king of the world. He thinks he's King Kong. Uh, yeah, you got to put him away for a while, but he's earned it. And I, I wouldn't run him to get him beat, you know. But it, it, it would be cool if they try. I'll say that. I'm with Randy. He's ah. such a cool horse. I mean, why rip his heart out? It's it's not as distance. You know, I mean, you could say if the Santa Anita, if the Big Cap and the Breeders' Cup Classic was on the same day, sure, give it a go. Go in the Big Cap. Do you know what I mean? Something like that. But I rip his heart out. He's such a cool dude. He's done everything they've asked of him. I I would put him on the shelf, give him a bit of a holiday, and come back next year. Sorry, Bill. No. I didn't know you were such a bully, Bill. <laughs> bullying him into it. I never thought of you as a bully. But you, you've been on to poor old Bill for the last ah. six months. You're so mean. <laughs> All right. So back to the the. Yeah, I'm I'm in the minority here. Um, the thing that I would bring up is what if he wins? 
this opens up a whole, you know, I think from what you guys said, I think both of you think he would not win either one of those races, but it opens up a world of possibilities for this horse. And the races he runs in all have purses of like 150,000, which is peanuts in this day and age. And if they, if he can prove he can win in a mile and a quarter on the dirt, then you really are talking about a potential horse of the year type campaign and Breeders Cup classics and maybe Saudi cups and Dubai World Cups and that sort of thing. I, honestly don't think they have anything to lose. So, uh, well, I guess uh, you two do, but um, if I owned them, and I sure wish I did, I wish I made that claim for 62,500 off of Wesley Ward, one of the great claims in the history of horse racing, um, I, I would go. By the way, his record on the turf, he's had seven starts on the turf with three wins, no seconds and no thirds, but he did win a little stakes race on the turf in t 2021, the war chant stakes at Churchill Down. So is he a better dirt horse? Most likely, but uh, you know, maybe he's gotten just so, so good all of a sudden that that form would translate over to um, the, uh, the turf. So but, maybe we'll find out. Um, so if the PP said owner, uh, Finley, comma Bill, you would you would run him in the classic. Yes, I'd run him in the classic. Yes, okay. that's just one man's opinion, but that's where I would go. So, all right. And if he wins the classic, I, I get a good. I'm going to do the. Uh, I told you so. Okay. And if he runs <laughs> ninth, you can you can throw it back at me. I'll, well, I, I, you know, I mean, I, you got to say though, even if Zoe and I wouldn't do it, if he runs in either the turf or the classic, it will be a huge storyline it will be a tremendous amount of interest in how he runs in either one of those races yeah that that, that is true and it would be uh you know the breeders cup is a great event as it is it doesn't need any help but man to have him in the breeders cup would really really spice things up the tdn writers room is brought to you by xb tv the xb tv work of the week is this friday's half mile work from drumroll please it was a national treasure who covered four furlongs in a sparkling 46 and four. Now you can see the rider just slapping him down the shoulder and getting after him. Bob's on the radio, go faster, go faster. And that's exactly what he wanted. National Treasure is scheduled to run next in the Million Dollar California Crown Saturday against one of Randy's favorite horses, Randy Senor Buscador. National Treasure is the winner of the Pegasus World Cup and the Metropolitan Handicap this year alone. Be a smarter, better with XB TV, the best horses. With thousands of exclusive morning workouts. All at your fingertips and delivered right into your inbox. Everything you need to be informed. Be smart, bet smart with XB TV. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. Meanwhile, congratulations to West Point Thoroughbreds, one of our sponsors here at the TD and Riders Room, when Battle of Normandy got up to beat a strong allowance field on Friday at Aqueduct for his third victory in a row. It marked the 60th win of the year for West Point, either solo or in partnerships. West Point is winning at a 19% clip this year and could pad those stats Sunday on Oklahoma Derby Day at Remington Park. Jackson Traveler goes in the David M. Vance stakes for trainer Steve Aspison. So fitting, by the way, that the former Remington GM is being uh, has been honored with the race name for him. One of my all-time favorite racetrack execs. That This is editorial, editorializing. Let's get back to West Point. Uh, West Point's Indispensable has also been entered in both the $400,000 Oklahoma Derby and the $1 million California Crown. We'll see which one of those West Point and partners choose to go in. 
Well, speaking of the California crown, why don't we try to pick some winners in the three California crown races? And we had an interesting discussion earlier in the show with Peter Rotundo, and, and I'll say it again. I think it's a tremendous idea what, what they've done here to put these races together because, um, you, you know, they're trying obviously to follow the lead of the, the Pegasus World Cup, which, be, which has been a, a big success story. I like National Treasure. Um, in the Whitney, he didn't run his race, but I'm wondering if he just hates the mud. Um, he's had three lifetime starts in, on, on a wet track, has never hit the board. And he also, in last year's Travers, ran in the mud and didn't run very well at all. He finished fifth in there. He's a horse that has got to bring his A game. There's no doubt about that, especially when you're running against some real good horses, including Senior Buscador and his stable mate, Muth. But uh, I think, you know, obviously B Baffert's going to have these horses primed for a big effort. Um, I think National Treasure when he's at his best, is a little bit better, maybe a little bit faster than other horses in the field, including Muth, who's going to take a lot of money, has never cracked the triple-digit buyer numbers yet. And uh, the uh, 96s, 97s, I doubt are going to get it done in this race. What do you think, Randy? Yeah, uh, Bob Baffert has won this race uh, eight times in all. He's finished second another 12 times. Uh, a few times he's run one, two in here. And I think the key to national treasure in this race is the fact that the uh, Pacific Classic runner up, a horse, a very fast horse named Full Serrano, did not come back and go in the California crown. He would have made things very interesting from a pace perspective for National Treasure. Uh, and Full Serrano's absence, it looks on paper like National Treasure, should be able to control the pace with Flavian Pratt. And that's really the name of his game. Now, if he wins, what's going to be interesting is uh, what they're going to do with him then. Uh, because a mile and a quarter is not really National Treasure's best distance. Last year, if you remember, he almost beat Cody's Wish in the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile, which was arguably the best performance in National Treasure's career. So it will be a tough call as to whether uh, after a win, if he wins on Saturday, whether they would go to the Classic or the Dirt Mile. I would guess the Classic just because it doesn't look like the Classic is as strong this year, perhaps, as it was in the past. Uh, Muth just finally gets a chance to run back in four weeks now. Um, he hasn't run back in four weeks since the gap as a two-year-old between the American Pharaoh and the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, and he ran a really good second in the Juvenile. Think back to what Muth's year has been like. Uh, he was going to run in the Rebel Stakes at Oakland Park, but Baffert didn't like the way that he trained. So uh, then he was off. Uh, he brought him back 12 weeks later to run in the Arkansas Derby. Okay, uh, He won that. Then it was going to be another small gap to the Preakness. They flew him to Pimlico to run in the Preakness, and he was there less than 24 hours when he developed a fever and had to be scratched from the Preakness. So then it was 22 weeks between races uh, when he finally ran in the shared belief uh, at Del Mar and, and won that one. So I think we're going to see a better Muth than we, uh, than we saw last time in the shared belief just because of that. He needed that race badly. If it's going to be good enough to beat a loose on the lead national treasure, if that's what indeed transpires, is going to be one of the real interesting things in here. And Senor Buscador is, uh, <laughs> is going to be flying at the end. And Zoe might want to give a little love, I'm sure you will, to Sub Sanador, who looked yeah. pretty darn good last time at Monmouth. It's going to be really interesting to see how Smith rides him because he made a crazy move at Monmouth yes. when he won on him. He looked like I was, I remember watching the race and I'm like, did, did Mike Smith turn into a bug boy? Where, where does he think he's going? And he just took off down the backside and it worked. So I don't know if he's going to have similar tactics aboard him. I think he's a better horse than we've seen, to be perfectly honest. Um, He's five years old. Now, Muth's going to be the lone three-year-old in here, the son of good magic. And he looks as good or if not better than I have ever seen him. He's filled out. He looks just absolutely fantastic right now. And you're talking about three-year-old facing older, but, you know, we're towards the end of the year. I'm not worried about that right now. National Treasure's work was good. But the writer was kind of niggling him and asking him every step of the way. And, and that's what Bob wanted. I'm going to take Moose on top in here with J.J. Hernandez, a three-year-old facing older to see if I can't beat National Treasure. 
As far as indispensable, we're obviously filming this on Tuesday. I did get a chance to speak to John Sadler this morning. And while he did say he's cross-entered, he was like kind of leaning towards running in Oklahoma. He was like, I'm going to be 20 to one here at Santa Anita. I'll be three to one there. So uh, nothing is official yet, but I think he's leaning that way. So Muth will indeed be the lone three-year-old in the field. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to take the three-year-old to beat the elders. We'll see if he can trounce national treasure. I Come honestly on. believe. Yes. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I, I think that it's Bob's race to lose. Yeah. And on the topic of Bob, I mean, we've all seen so many times when uh, Baffert wins with uh, what we refer to as the other horse. Yeah. Uh, well, there is a, another Baffert horse that we haven't talked about that probably should be mentioned, and that's Newgate. Uh, Newgate is, is running for the first time since a very disappointing performance in the Dubai World Cup. But before that, uh, he won the, the big cap at a mile and a quarter and um, and beat Sub Sanador. And I don't think you could you could watch that race and not think that Newgate was better than the head margin of victory. Because he was three wide on the first turn, four wide on the second turn. Some Sanador set the pace on the rail all the way around, and Newgate was still able to run him down. So Newgate is uh, is a solid horse. If we don't get Frankie Dettori, I think, because of his injury. Um, he's supposed to come back this weekend, but Johnny Velasquez is now named to ride Newgate. Uh, he's got the rail. He'll save ground early. Um, I, I think Newgate has a fighting chance in here as well to be the other Baffert horse again. So let's quickly just take a look at the other two California crown races. I'll just make my pick and then throw it out to you guys and you can uh, take it where you want. The uh, California crown, John Henry is the seventh race. It is a mile and a quarter on the turf. And this is Phil D'Amato territory, just like the uh, two-year-old dirt races are Bob Baffert territory. I like Balnikoff, uh, ran a very, I thought a very good race in the Del Mar handicap, closing into a ridiculously slow pace and losing by only a neck gets Flavian Pratt aboard. Then the Eddie D down the hill at six and a half furlongs. This has a purse also of $750,000. And I like the New York horse, Big Invasion. Um, I'm, he's never gone down the hill, but uh, this is a horse who is in very good form right now. And, I, you know, I'm biased, I guess. I just think the, the bracing is better in the East Coast right now than it is in California. And uh, so I think that he's going to translate that form no problem. And, and he must like this turf course because he was second beaten in neck last year in the Breeders' Cup turf sprint. Uh, Zoe, I have a question for you uh, quickly on the uh, Eddie D. Um, the six and the six and a half furlong races down the hill. Where do post positions play into it? Because I'm picking a horse that got the eleven post. Is that good, oh, bad? That, that's or good. 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 Yeah, you need outside because you're making a right-handed turn going up the hill. So inside becomes outside. It's it, outside's the place to be. He's in a good spot. You know, I would be a little bit worried about Big Invasion if you were bringing in a jock from New York, but you're getting Pratt, who knows the hill better than anyone. So I'm with you on. Big invasion. As far as the John Henry, uh, Balnikoff, yes. And he's also eligible for a big bonus. Having won the dinner party stakes at Pimlico in the spring, should he win this and then win the Pegasus turf, he's eligible for a $2.5 million bonus. So you know that Phil D'Amato is hankering after that. So Balnikoff, I believe, is the horse to beat. The Eddie D is probably the best betting race on the card, as far as I'm concerned. Well, I do like Big Invasion, there are so many ways to go. Like, who would you pick in there, Randy? Uh, in the uh, in the Eddie D, I'm yeah. with I'm I'm with Bill. I mean, I I think j just like the European horses are better than the American horses when they come over here. I think the turf racing in this country is better in New York than it is in Southern California, generally. Now, that's no just a, that's just a kind of blanket general statement. There are exceptions. Uh, and I think big invasion, I think six, he's never been down the hill, which is a disadvantage, but six and a half furlong seems like a perfect distance for him. You know, five and a half, six, seven have been his best distances so far. And so I think he'd be the horse to beat in there. But as far as the, uh, as far as the John Henry goes, look, with Balnikoff, you get Flavian Pratt, but with Balnikoff, with Rock Emperor, with Masterpiece, 
you get these horses that are extremely pace dependent. They win a very low percentage of their starts. Like Matt Balnikoff is always flying at the end, but coming up just short. Uh, he had the fastest final quarter mile time in each of his last two races. There will be more pace in here. Cabo Spirit is going to go to the lead from post position number one. So there's going to be more pace than we saw last time with Dicey Mochara uh, in the Del Mar Handicap. But I like horses that like to win, that want to win, that do win with some regularity. And that's Gold Phoenix. I think he's won like six of his last 14 starts. Uh, he's, he's a bit more tactical. He can come from way back. He can be a little closer. He can be inside. He can be outside. Um, he'll also be helped by a little bit more pace in there. So I'll go for him for that reason. Watch out for King of Gosford in the Eddie D. He's two for two down the hill, the other Phil D'Amato. All right, let's switch gears and switch coasts and go to uh, Aqueduct where there is uh, two major races on the card on Saturday, the Woodward and the Joe Hurst Turf Classic. And, you know, um, I think among the three, uh, I'm just the only one to grow up in the East Coast. I grew up in New York racing. It's glory days when races like this uh, were as important as any race on the calendar. Take this for a string of greatness from 1974 to 1980. Here were the following winners, four in a row for Forgo, Seattle Slough, a firmed and spectacular bid in a walkover. That is what we expect out of races like this, or we used to expect out of races like this. Um, it's very sad to me to, to see this race just completely fall apart. Uh, there's, it's going to be that K Army horse, the uh, Chilean horse is not going to run. They have a uh, field of four in the Woodward and, uh, you know, certainly no superstars. And I've said this before, I think Naira ought to take a good look at just kind of abandoning some of these races. Um, these four horse fields and, and major stakes races aren't working. Skippy Longstocking is the only speed in the race and should win. Well, look, back back in the glory days that you just mentioned in Belmont Park, um, that meeting still is, and it was then called the Fall Championship Meet for a reason. Before the Breeders' Cup, that's where championships more often than not were won or lost. You had to come to New York. The top trainers in California, the Las Barreras, the Charlie Whittinghams, ship their horses from California to Belmont Park to run in those races because that's how you could get your Eclipse Awards. Now, with the Breeders' Cup, it's no longer the case. Uh, races like the Woodward and the Jockey Club Gold Cup, et cetera, are just a means to an end. They're still big races on their own. They're still very prestigious, but they're used to try to advance the horses to get to the Breeders' Cup Classic. And in that regard, you can do that in California. You can do it in Kentucky. You can do it in New York. They're no longer the be-all and the end-all as far as championship racing goes. I agree with you about Skippy Longstocking. Um, I'm not, I don't entirely trust that Kruppi is as good as his last speed figure indicated. I never trust Tappet Trice to run uh, an A race in any situation, although he's always capable of it. So uh, I like Skippy. I'm with Skippy. And it's a shame. I mean, I don't know what the, how we solve this. Maybe the greatest stakes committee just needs to sit down and be like, all right, this is the deal. I, I don't know, but it's a shame on this particular weekend, we have all of these grade one, grade two events for older horses. And you got horses all over the place because you got the Woodward and then you've got the Akak -Ak at Churchill. I mean, if can you imagine if all of these horses were running in one race or even just two races this particular weekend? We've got to do something to fix it. You can't have four races for horses with the same conditions all the horses going long. That it's is indeed much. a problem. The other uh, stake race on the card at uh, Belmont at the Big A, which, which they call it these days, is the Joe Hirsch Turf Classic, named after the goat of racing riders, Mr. Joe Hirsch, who was a wonderful man and a wonderful columnist many years for the daily racing form. And I think uh, good old Warlike Goddess is going to do it again. She's taken on the boys for the third straight year in this race. She's won in each of them the last two years. And not only is she probably the best horse in the race or might be the best horse in the race, she, Randy, you're talking about other horses that are pace dependent. She's very pace dependent. And there is a lot of enough speed in here between get smoking and silver knot that there is bound to be a fairly decent early pace in here. And I think she's going to love that. She'll come chugging through the lane and get up uh, for Bill Mott. Yeah. 
Okay. That's okay. I, I do not think that the seven year old war goddess is as good of a horse as Silver Knot. Uh, Silver Knot got a very uncharacteristically atrocious ride from Flavian Pratt last time when he and Johnny Velasquez actually allowed Far Bridge, I think it was Velasquez, allowed Far Bridge just to walk on the front end in super slow fractions. Um, you look, I think this is Silver Knot's race. Uh, race to win or lose. And I, I think Warlike Goddess will run well, but I just don't think she's as good as Silver Knot. She is a testament to Bill Mott to keep her going at seven yeah. years old, because not only like imagine a seven-year-old horse or a gelding, that's fine. But to get a seven-year-old mare, you know how persnickety us old mares get mm -hmm. in our older years to keep one healthy and happy all this time is amazing. It's a true testament to his training ability. Is she as good as Silver Knot? I don't know. There's going to be a ton of pace in here. But, I mean, how fast are they going to go, Bill? I mean, we talk about pace. They're going to all strangle their horses and go half in 51 or 52. No, uh, see, I would, dis I would disagree. That's normally what would happen in, with these races without that much speed. They're not going to go 46. I understand that. But I'll set the over-under on the first half at 49 and 2. Over. Randy, over or under? Over. Randy? Well, you got Get Smoking in there, who's kind of hard to slow down. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, he he typically uh, will be going in 48 and change in a race like this. You know, that he might go in 49, but I don't think you're going to see uh, Get Smoking be able to be slowed down to 50. So I think there's going to be more speed in here than, uh, than might typically be the case in these New York races at a mile and a half, just because of his presence. But I think Silver Knot's going to get the dream trip. Get smoke and blast off from the inside. It opens up, and Dylan Davis is going to have Silver Knot just galloping along in second right behind him. We'll get, we've got a bit of rain coming all week into New York. It's Saturday, a 30% chance of rain, so check the weather. Right. We will check the weather indeed to see. Hopefully, it'll be a nice weekend in New York and in California as well. But a beautiful time of year, uh, the early fall right now. The TDN Breeders' Cup Connection Series tells the stories, guys, of the bond between Breeders' Cup contenders and people who work with them behind the scenes. Each week, up until now to the Breeders' Cup, we'll highlight a piece from the series. And Katie Petruniak has been doing these, and she's been doing a terrific job. This week, we have my old mucker, a fellow countryman, Lee Vickers, as a... Uh, uh, one of the guys we're going to be talking about. He started out as a jockey in England before moving to the U.S. to work for trainer Christophe Clement. This year, he is the exercise rider, Breeders' Cup turf hopeful, Far Bridge. He's got his quirks. He's a quirky character, um, but he's all heart and he's got a serious engine. But he is an incredible horse and we adore him. We just found him unlucky in some of his races. Poor trips, I think. I think he got a bit unlucky. And the other day, everything went right, and uh, he showed to everyone that he's a top-class individual. Far Bridge measured time. Far Bridge will not be denied. All the way in the Resorts World Casino Sword Dancer. I just feel incredibly lucky to be in the industry. Um, it's a labor of love, but it has taken me all around the world, introduced me to some lovely people, great teams, great horses. In the heart of horse country, where the passion for the horse runs deep, one name stands out, Macaulay's. Since 1938, Macaulay's Feed has been the trusted name in providing exceptional equine nutrition. Macaulay's commitment goes beyond the bag. Our dedicated team is with you from day one. Experience the legacy of Macaulay's and give your horse the nutrition they deserve. Macaulay's, the feed of champions. And one more thing I want to point out before we uh, sign off. Of his, I think I just said that the Johnny Velasquez was involved in that sword dancer race where measured to, or where Far Bridge was able to set a ridiculously slow pace. It was Flavian Pratt and William Buick, uh, not Johnny V, who were sitting right behind him on Godolphin horses and allowing Far Bridge to set such an easy pace. So my apologies there to Johnny V. All right. Well, that is a wrap on this week's edition of the Thoroughbred Daily News Writers Room Podcast. I want to thank my partners, Randy Moss, Zoe Kevin, good to have you back, and our people behind the scenes, Katie Petruniak 
Anthony LaRocca and Leela LaRocca, our producers and directors and editors. And our special guest this week was Peter Rotundo. Thanks to all. We'll see you. Have a great weekend of racing. We'll see you next week. Thank you.